Today, I want to talk about uh, anonymous sources. Um, uh, before I do, uh, I want to go back to really the first thing um, that I said to you all on our first day, uh, which is to remind you of the, the kind of abiding ethic of journalism that should frame everything else we talk about in here. Can anyone here remember what that was? Um, the first ethical responsibility uh, of a journalist is to uncover and report the truth. Um, there are other ways to frame uh, that notion, but that's for the purposes of this class, that's the way I guess I'd like you to think about it. Um, that needs to guide everything else we talk about, because if we don't do that, if we're not successful at uncovering and reporting the truth, then the rest of it is really just sort of a waste of time. Um, that's what journalism needs to do. So all other ethics have to serve that in some way. And, and the reason I want to stress that, especially here today, um, is first to call your attention to the fact that there's two elements to that. There is uncovering the truth, and there's reporting the truth. Um, and generally, those two ideas go quite hand in hand. Hi. Um, you, you, know, you go out, you interview people, you obtain records, you review records, you, you go to scenes of events, you describe those scenes. The reporting uh, feeds the writing. You then write what you've seen, heard, learned, um, and you put that in a story, and you've successfully uncovered and reported the truth. What makes uh, the use of anonymous sources so complicated as an ethical matter, as opposed to as a practical matter, what makes it so complicated as an ethical matter is that it, it creates a paradox. Um, that with a, with, when you use an anonymous source to report a, a piece of information, you are making a decision to deliberately conceal one aspect of the truth, which is who gave it to you. Sometimes that's of minimal relevance, sometimes that's of huge relevance. Um, but the, the paradox then is that sometimes the only way to uncover the truth is to compromise the telling of the truth. So that what it takes to get the story, promising a source that you won't identify that source, in some way undermines the ultimate story because you're not completely coming clean with your reader. I guess what, before we get, I'd like to, to sort of do this today through a couple of case studies, three in fact. Um, but before we get to that, let me just say then that because there is this inherent paradox in the use of anonymous sources in terms of, of serving this larger ethic of journalism, I, I am suspicious of any blanket rule as a, on the use of sources. There are papers that have experimented with banning the use of anonymous sources altogether. In my view, that either causes you to have to make sort of strange compromises in your writing, or it causes you not to report certain things that you ought to be reporting. It compromises your ethical responsibility to uncover the truth because you're trying to be so rigorous about reporting the truth. Um, on the flip side, any news organization that is casual about its use of anonymous sources is risking compromising the second half of that value. That if you are cavalierly allowing people to go off the record and reporting things that they tell you without identifying them, you may be doing a, a good job uncovering the truth, but you're doing a bad job reporting the truth. So it's, it's balance that we're after here. Um, and therefore, as I say, I'm suspicious of any blanket rule on this. Um, really what we'll, we'll be guided by uh, in, these, uh, in the conversation about the use of these sources is how important is the information? Um, what, do, what can we find out and report about the motives of the source who's giving us the information? And, for, and, and in a really practical way, in a really newsroom way, how reliable is the reporter who's going out and getting it? How much faith do we have in them to have made sophisticated choices about this kind of information? So as we're assessing um, the use of these sources, I would propose that there's a few rules or guidelines, let me say, to sort of give us structure for how to evaluate whether they're useful or not. First, you should try to disclose as much information as you can. Um, if your source is a, uh, a member of the, you know, a, a Republican staff member of the you know, Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, if you can say that, that goes a long way toward indicating any bias or predisposition that your source might have for giving you the information. It shows where the source is located in the government. It might show if you can identify whether they're a Republican or a Democrat, what inclinations they might have. So disclosing, identifying information without the name sometimes goes a long way toward, toward addressing the problem. You need, I think, uh, in addition to try to sniff out any manipulation uh, that you can in the use, in the conversation you're having with this source. Sometimes sources, sources will talk for all kinds of reasons, and I don't want to go too far down this path here today, but, you know, I mean, sources will talk to you because they want to impress you. Sources will talk to you because they like you. Sources will talk to you because they think it's important that something get out. 
Uh, but sources will also talk to you to manipulate you or to get something in the record that they're afraid to do on their own. And what you have to be really sensitive to, really careful about, is trying to figure out why the source is talking to you. Because that may affect your determination later about how reliable you consider the information. Um, in addition, there are certain strictures that you have to put on the use of anonymous information. You can't let sources use their anonymity to get at other people. Because then they're using you to get at other people. And you're, you're going to be forced to take responsibility for something that they may not be willing to take responsibility for. Um, so you can't, uh, you really should avoid having a source say, you know, I want to tell you about this meeting that I was in the other day because, you know, Bob Smith who was in the meeting just proved that he's an idiot. Um, now that may be true, Bob Smith may be an idiot, but you can't let the anonymous source use his or her anonymity to, to denigrate someone else uh, because then in effect what they're doing is they're making you denigrate that person without being willing to do it themselves. Uh, and finally, I would say, and, and in some ways most importantly here, uh, anonymous sources may not use their anonymity to lie. Um, I'm about to give you a hypothetical here, and, and you'll see, I think, uh, quite clearly the consequences of anonymous sources who lie. But, but I should stress, the consequences are all on the reporter and the publication. Because you've allowed the person to go to be anonymous in this, you've now shouldered all the responsibility for any lying or any denigrating or anything they might do. So you're accepting a huge burden when you allow someone to go off the record with you. And as a result, you're entitled to expect certain things of your sources. One of them is that they tell you the truth. Um, now, uh, there is, oh, actually, I should add one more obligation here, although it's of a slightly different type. That in, in any time you're using information that you've obtained from a source who's not on the record, it creates a huge burden on you to double check the information. Um, you know, there's a, a, a sort of misnomer uh, in journalism. You may have uh, heard it, this idea of the two source rule. Um, I think it comes out of the All the President's Men movie or something. Um, and, and yes, it's true that anything you get from an anonymous source ought to be confirmed from another source. But just the two source rule is, is sort of a, a, a silly uh, shorthand. Um, you, two sources can be just as bad as one. Um, in, in the sense of, I'll give you, oops, my goodness, what have I done? Um, the, uh, when I was covering the, uh, the Simpson case, for instance, uh, there were a lot of mistakes made uh, by various news organizations in covering Simpson. I'm happy to say that LA Times wasn't one of them. But um, I, I don't know how some of those mistakes got made, but I have a guess, um, which is that sometimes you can fool yourself into thinking that, um, that you've got uh, two sources that are sort of checking each other, when in fact you've just got two people who are talking to each other. If you talk to two police officers in the Simpson case, two detectives, say, in the robbery homicide division, you haven't talked to two sources. You've talked to one guy who agree on what they've seen. If you talk to, uh, you know, in that case, you guys uh, won't remember it. I remember it all too well. But if you talk to two members of Simpson's defense team, Johnny Cochran and Carl Douglas, say, you haven't talked to two sources. You've talked to two people who agree on their interpretation of the evidence. Well, you've gotten to real, you've validated information when you've talked to a prosecutor, a police officer, and a defense lawyer, or an investigator for the defense and an investigator for the police department, or, or, or whatever. But my point is that you need to talk to people who don't agree on the conclusion, but do agree on the fact that you're trying to report. Then you're on to something. I mean, then you've got some reasonable assurance that you're not just being strung along. You're not just being manipulated. Sorry, I'm going to do that again. Um, uh, so uh, my, my point there is obvious, I guess, which is to say that the number of sources is not what's important. The perspective that the sources have on the information is what's important. Um, this is something, by the way, that when you're talking to sources, if you're in a working reporter capacity, this is something to be talking to your editor about all the time. Because it, once you promise a source anonymity, you've committed not just yourself to that, you've committed your news organization to it. Um, you need to not be making these promises ca uh, casually. All right, so let me start then, or let me move next to uh, a hypothetical. Uh, and I'll be, I'm going to turn it over to you all in a minute to, for your uh, per sense of this. So, so listen up. Um, OK, imagine you're a reporter and you cover the city council and you're, you're wherever you're working. A member of the city council comes to you and says he's got a, a juicy story. But he will only tell you if you, agree, if you agree to go off the record. You agree. So now you've said, all right, I'm not going to use your name. <clears throat> 
The council member says that that day the city attorney uh, has uh, briefed members of this council's public safety committee or you know law enforcement committee, whatever it's called in the city, that leaders of the police department are under investigation by the FBI, that they are believed to have uh, been skimming uh, federal grant money or stealing money uh, somehow from the department. Uh, the city attorney has told these council members that they're expecting indictments, uh, that the mayor's office is aware of it, that they're trying to figure out whether to suspend these command officers or how to proceed while this investigation goes under, is underway. So you've got, a, you've got a hell of a set of facts now, or set of allegations anyway. Um, and what's important is that they're not known just to this source, right? The source has now told you, the mayor's office knows about it, people in the police department know about it, people in the city attorney's office, obviously some council members know about it. So that gives you some sense of a roadmap of now how to proceed, how to go to confirm this information. So you start calling around. Uh, some of the command officers may or may not be aware of it. Some of them probably have lawyers. They may, they may provide information. There's, if there's a grand jury meeting, prosecutors will know about that. In any case, you, you can sort of create a template or you know, an idea of where you need to head. So uh, as the day goes on, uh, you find a source uh, at the FBI. And that source says, oh, I'm not going to tell you anything on the record, but I can tell you that this is true. Uh, it is true that we've got an investigation ongoing. It is true that that's the allegation. And I'll, con I'll confirm for you off the record that some of the names of the command officers that you've received are correct. Um, so you, um, you go ahead, you write your story, you put it in the paper. This is a big story. It's on page one the next day. Um, and you know, all hell breaks loose, as things tend to do when you write a story like that. Um, and, oh, I should add, you've, made care, you've been careful in the story to report what's been told you, and you've attributed, to quote, officials familiar with the investigation. Um, now, that refers, in this, <coughs> in this case, at least to the council member and the FBI source. You may have gotten some other confirmation of bits and pieces elsewhere. Uh, but that's what they're, that's, they go by that sort of general attribution. Um, OK, so the next day the story comes out. The city attorney, of course, is outraged. Uh, the city attorney has briefed uh, council members in confidence. And now this information has come out. And it threatens to mess up his investigation. He's, you know, it threatens to, to sort of upset the whole apple cart. So he's pissed. Uh, so he calls a press conference. And he says that he's going to initiate a leak investigation to find out who told you this information. Um, he doesn't deny that the story is true, by the way. In fact, uh, the weak investigations generally are pursuant to something that is true. Um, so uh, so you're, in a sense, the, the story itself is being confirmed for you, uh, but the, the source now is at issue. Later in that same day, your original source, the council member, calls a press conference too. And he says he's outraged by the leak, and he accuses another member of the council of being the likely source. OK? Now you're fucked. Um, this, this is a, you've made a promise now to this source. You know he's not telling the truth. Uh, you know, in fact, not only that he's lying, but that he's lying to try to get someone else in trouble who you never talked to. So what do you do? Anyone want to try at this? <clears throat> this is not an easy one. <laughs> um, any thoughts? All right, well, let me talk a little more and then interrupt me if anything occurs to you. Um, here's a couple options uh, to think about. One. You could go to your editor and say, I, I can't be part of this coverage anymore. <clears throat> because you know the answer, by the way. There's now a leak investigation that's all questioning something that you know the answer to. So if you're going to report the truth, you'd answer it. But why can't you do that? Hmm? Because spoke to that right. And when you spoke to him off the record, if, you, if presumably that initial conversation you said, I won't give up your name to anyone, not only do you have an ethical obligation to protect it, you've made a contract with that person. If you give up his name now, he can sue you too. Um, because he's going to get in trouble. He's going to, you know, it could cost him his position politically. A politician probably would have less leeway to go after you than if it had come from a staff member or something. But, but whoever your source is, in this case the councilman, you've made a deal and you can't get out of it. Um, so you, you could recuse yourself from the coverage, but you know, your paper is then going to run a story the next day saying that this council member accused someone else of doing it. And the, the, you, while, while the particular author of that story may not know the truth, other people at the paper, including you, are going to know. Yeah. Well, I mean, that would be an issue for a judge and a jury uh, to, d to decide. Uh, and, you know, as a practical matter, the chances of a council member suing you uh, under these circumstances are probably low. But a, a, 
I don't want to do a whole new hypothetical, but imagine um, that this information had come, imagine it was about a pending business deal, um, and it had come from an employee of a company uh, you know, that was involved in the deal and reporting this squashed the deal. So the, and the, the employee then got fired. Um, and the employee had talked to you because he felt the deal was you know, unethical or something was wrong. He was trying to do the right thing. Um, that person, uh, who is you know a less public figure than this person, might well bring a lawsuit, and your contract might well, your agreement might well be held to be a binding verbal contract, um, and and there will be real damages to that person. That person could lose a job, might never work again, and you might be on the hook for all that. Yeah, remind me of your name. Tom. Tom, oh, you were back there last time, right? Yeah, I'm right. Okay. So uh, it's legal to say that because he's trying to blame it on someone else. On the council, right? So you could, isn't it legal just to like keep saying no? That wasn't the right person until they figure out that this guy's obviously. You know, right. right. It's funny you should mention that. I don't uh, know the precise details of this, but many years ago there was a case involving an LA Times reporter long before I was there, um, where I think it was in the Manson trial. In fact, it was in a very celebrated criminal trial uh, in LA, where. He, he reported a piece of information and then was asked who the source was. And he said, I, I wouldn't answer. But he said, well, I can tell you it's not him, though. I mean, I'm, I'm blurring out a lot of the detail because I forget it. But uh, uh -uh. You can't do, you're not allowed to just sort of clear the people you want to clear and then say, I don't answer on anyone else. For the obvious reason, that, that investigation ends in about 10 minutes. You know? um, no, if you make an agreement not to say who the source is, you are implicitly making an agreement not to say who the source isn't. Uh, you're stuck with the whole thing, that you're not going to talk about it. There is, uh, this again goes a little far afield, and we'll talk about it when we get to legal issues later in the course, but um, there is also a principle that w you do not report information outside of your stories uh, you, unless you're reporting it in your story. So you don't want to get into the business uh, of telling people things that you didn't write about, um, and that fall, it's called unpublished information, and this would fall in that category. Yes? Um, isn't it like liable or something for him to be saying, like, if it actually went to, like, trial because you're only protecting the person who is, like, Well, that's a good question, uh, and that would be his issue. Uh, I mean, you know, it could well be that the council member who was falsely accused of him, it would depend on how he said it, I guess, so I'm just going to get rid of this. Um, it would, you know, if he said, you know, my own suspicion is that it's so and so, he might be able to word it in such a way that it didn't put him completely on the hook. But that, you're right, there may well be some, you, you can be sure there's going to be a fight between the two, those two council members, whether it's a legal fight or, or what, what form it's going to take is hard to tell. Um, but but you've got your own set of problems. He's now creating problems for himself, but you've got your own, and, the, and I'm trying to focus on those. Um, um, okay, so uh, if you then make the principle, make what really is kind of your own only legal option here, which is to continue to protect the source, then what about the principles that we talked about at the outset here? You have a job to uncover and report the truth. You've done so in the first instance, right? Your story initially has succeeded in doing that. You've uncovered some interesting, important facts. You've reported them. Nobody is denying them. But you also made a decision to not disclose certain facts, which is to say the names of the council member and the FBI agent. And now, what do you do? And you, there is nothing, really, there is no way, uh, the reason I, uh, I'm forgiving of people not knowing the answer to this is there's no real way out of this. Um, you are on the hook now. Your paper can figure out ways to try to report around you, and you can try to do things to minimize the problem. But the fact that you entered into the original agreement with the source casually, where he said to you, if you'll recall my setup, he said to you, I'll only tell you if you let me do it off the record. That was the missed opportunity. Um, and we're gonna, I'd like to talk more on Thursday, about, on Thursday rather, about some of the practical ways of handling anonymous sources. But it was that blanket promise to him that I'll just never use your name. That's what boxed you in. If you had said to him, listen, I, I'll protect you, but I need something too. I need to be sure you're telling me the truth. And as long as you're telling me the truth, as long as you tell the truth, I'll stick with you. That might get you out of this problem. Because then you'd call him up after he had his press conference and say, you know what? Screw you. you. I told you, you had to tell the truth. You're now lying. You know you're lying. Deal's off. Uh, now, that's a harder conversation to have. It's a lot easier. Uh, and believe me, I've been uh, too casual about this in the course of my life. Uh, it is. E very easy when a source tells you, I have something great, to say, 
Well, I don't use your name. Go ahead, tell me. Because you want to know. I mean, you know, you don't, you don't get this far in this business if you're not curious. Um, uh, I, I would say, and this has become more of an issue throughout the course of my career over the last, you know, 20 or 25 years, um, people are much more conscientious today about making that promise carefully. And the failure to do so in this hypothetical is what got this reporter, you know, hypothetically one of us, into this trouble. Um, all right, let me move on to a real case. Um, uh, it's one part of your reading, and uh, maybe all of you have read it, maybe some of you haven't yet, but, uh, um, and that involves Judy Miller uh, and the New York Times. Um, this is a quite celebrated uh, recent case of the, uh, that bears on the issue of protecting anonymous sources. Um, very short version of this, um, uh, Judy Miller, very controversial uh, uh, reporter for many years at the New York Times. Um, has reported a lot of uh, big, important stories over the years, and also uh, has been highly criticized, uh, most notably for her reporting on the existence of weapons of mass destruction uh, in Iraq leading up to the war. <coughs> um, stories that were generated by sources in Washington, principally. She had, um, she has, she's famous for having a huge array of sources. Um, uh, again, to not uh, um, belabor all this, so let me, the short version, she has two, at least two uh, important conversations with Scooter Libby in the summer of 2003. Uh, Scooter Libby, as some of you will remember, uh, was, an, was an aide to uh, Dick Cheney, worked a prominent, uh, important person in the vice president's office. Those uh, conversations, uh, which occurred on June 23rd and July 8th of 2003, um, Judy kept notes of. <clears throat> and uh, there is a suggestion, it's a little unclear because her memory was a little hazy when it finally came time to talk about this, um, whether Libby specifically told her about this or not, but there were some notes of those conversations. And in essence, what the issue was is that, um, sort of to back up a little bit, there's a guy named Joe Wilson who had been an ambassador to Iraq uh, temporarily and had served as an ambassador uh, in Africa. Um, Joe Wilson had, at the behest of the CIA, gone to Africa um, to conduct a, a sort of a, an investigation to determine whether the country of Niger or other African countries had been sought out by Iraq to buy uh, material for nuclear weapons. Um, Wilson went, reported back, um, and reported back very skeptically. He had real doubts about whether that had happened. Notwithstanding his skepticism, President Bush had said publicly, in fact, in his State of the Union address, that there was evidence that Iraq had sought nuclear material from Iraq, uh, from uh, Africa. So Wilson, um, uh, as a background source for a number of newspapers, tells them, raises real doubts uh, about this. And there's a whole controversy about whether that passage, it's actually a 16-word statement within the State of the Union address, whether it was false or not. And if false, whether, whether the president uh, lied or whether somebody lied to the president and he put it in. So there's a whole controversy brewing around this issue. When on uh, July 6th of 2003, Wilson writes a piece in the New York Times. It's called What I Didn't Find. Um, it's an op-ed piece, and it's all about what his trip to Africa and his conclusion, ultimately, that Iraq did not get nuclear material from Africa. Um, this enraged uh, the administration. It seemed to suggest that they were lying, obviously, and they have every right uh, if, if, to disagree with it. Um, what they then discovered uh, in the course of sort of learning about Wilson is that he was married to a woman named Valerie Plain. Valerie Plain worked for the CIA. Now, whether she was an undercover operative or not is also a matter of some dispute. But in any case, she was not publicly known to work for the CIA, um, and, but the administration knew that she did. So they suggested, and, and Libby appears to have suggested to Judy, uh, uh, to Judy Miller, in these uh, conversations in June and July, that, he ought, that she ought to look into Valerie Plain. Now, her notes are a little hazy on this, as I said. At one point, they say they use the name Valerie Flame. Uh, at another point, it's uh, Valerie Wilson, presumably, because she's married to Joe Wilson. Um, she's not clear whether Libby used the words or not, but they show up in her notes at about the same part as her interviews with him. So here's the question, then, for Libby. It's illegal to out a CIA agent. You can't intentionally put a CIA, for obvious reasons, you're a government official, you can't go around just revealing the identities of CIA agents who piss you off. Uh, because you get them killed. Now, there's no evidence anyone tried to kill Valerie Plame, but it's clearly something that you don't want government officials doing when they're mad at people. Um, uh, so then uh, there's an investigation uh, into the court. CIA wanted an investigation to determine who outed its operative. Um, 
The rub in this case, what makes this case so complicated, um, is that the offense that the, the whoever out of the CIA agent committed the offense in the conversation with the journalist. Um, so that it's not a matter of a source saying something off the record about something that they saw or heard somewhere else. In my hypothetical, for instance, it's presumably not illegal for the council member to tell you or the, your, the reporter uh, what was said in that council briefing. Here, the conversation with the journalist is the criminal offense. The, the defendant, the suspect, can plead the Fifth Amendment. You have every unshakable constitutional right not to incriminate yourself uh, by the, the, under questioning by the government. So if you're Fitzgerald, uh, Patrick Fitzgerald is, is the prosecutor who is, who is uh, appointed to look into this, there's two sources for it, right? There's the journalist and there's the suspect. If the suspect can say, I have a Fifth Amendment right not to talk to you, and the journalist can say, I have a First Amendment right not to talk to you, you're kind of done. Um, now, complicating this even further, a week after the second conversation that, that uh, Judy Miller had with Scooter Libby, Robert Novak, uh, sort of long-standing but slightly disreputable columnist, um, uh, wrote a column in which he named her. He said, Valerie Blame, husband of Joe Wilson, CIA officer. Um, now, Judy Miller hasn't reported anything. But now, because uh, Novak has reported it, and the CIA wants this investigation, Fitzgerald now starts to poke around and figure out who talked to who. Um, you know, as I say, uh, it's the, the thing that makes this complicated is there's very few sources for him to go to to find out who did it. Um, because the journalists have one set of protections, or argue one set of protections, and the, and the suspects have another. Um, at one point, there is an, an issue that's raised in this case uh, that people have talked a lot about since, um, which is waivers. Um, the idea was, what if everyone who is a potential source for this signed a waiver saying, it's okay with me if the, reporter, if the reporters say what they know. So let's say you're working in the White House, and you didn't talk to Miller, you didn't talk to Novak, you didn't talk to any of the people who are part of this case. You'd say, you know what, I, I'll sign an, a, an agreement that says, you can talk about any conversations I had with you, because uh, I'm sick of being a, a suspect in this. The problem with waivers uh, and, is that it's sort of like the, the example that you used earlier. It's sort of like saying it, it, it eliminates everyone, and then there's one person left standing. You know? So that if everyone but one person signs a waiver, well, you've kind of answered the question in this roundabout way. So uh, Judy Miller and the New York Times properly wouldn't accept uh, waivers. Their position was, until the source tells us directly that we're, we are released from the promise, we're going to protect the confidentiality of the source. So what happened? Judy went to jail. Um, she was uh, jailed for contempt. She was ordered to, uh, by the court to testify. Okay. Uh, she refused uh, to disclose the source, and she was put in jail. Um, now, uh, she spent, I, I should have looked this up today, I think it was 80 some days in jail. She spent a long time, 85, all right. Um, and ultimately, her ethical position is undermined by the fact that she comes out of jail and discloses the source. But let me not skip to that quite yet. Um, the case had huge uh, reverberations uh, on this issue, the issue of how far you can go to protect anonymous sources. Um, for many years, uh, reporters uh, had been laboring under the, the position uh, that the Constitution created a right not to disclose a source. The First Amendment is unequivocal in its language. Congress may make no law uh, that abridges the freedom of the press or the freedom of speech, two, two issues which are both cited here. Um, there was a decision in 1973, though, of the United States Supreme Court, it's called Brandsburg, um, that had the, the most a vexing outcome. It was a four to four to one uh, decision, uh, which you can imagine how helpful that is. Um, in essence, five, uh, members of the Supreme Court ruled that a, the, a reporter, the reporter in this case, didn't have a right not to testify at a grand jury in a criminal case. So they ordered him to testify. So that would seem to stand for the proposition that there isn't an absolute right to protect a source. But one justice, Justice Powell, that's his, which is why it's referred to as a 4 to 4 to 1 decision, while he joined that finding in this case, he also uh, wrote separately to say that there would be cases where he could imagine that reporters could protect the source. So no one really knew what to make of Brandsburg. So the news organizations uh, and, and their lawyers 
made great use of this over the years and essentially just pretended that we had the right to protect sources. Um, Fitzgerald, in this case, tested that right and found out, no, that we didn't ever have that right, even if we thought we did all those years. Um, so uh, it, it then creates, in the meantime, though, many states did create that right. California, for instance, has what's called a shield law. Under California law, uh, um, under almost any circumstances, if I have an anonymous source, I don't have to reveal it uh, be, you know, in a court. There are some exceptions. If you're a criminal defendant and you argue that your fair trial rights are being inhibited by my use of the shield law, I can be forced sometime to disclose it. But in California, anyway, there's a pretty solid set of protections. But what, are, what do you do if you're a reporter working in California and you can protect your source in a state proceeding but not in a federal proceeding? Or if you're a reporter for the Los Angeles Times working in Washington, D.C., are you going to be covered by the California Shield Law or are you going to be covered by the absence of the federal shield law? So this, it's created this great confusion. And in fact, even as I talk to you here today, Congress is debating whether to enact a federal shield law. If it did, it would then create some of the same protections that we enjoy in California. And it would create, I hope, some kind of clarity across uh, these issues. Um, in the meantime, though, here's the great irony of the Libby case is that Scooter Libby, who was charged with obstruction of justice and with lying to investigators, was convicted of those counts, spent less time in jail than Judy Miller did for protecting his identity. Um, President Bush commuted his sentence. Um, so he never went to jail. Judy did. Um, so as an ethical matter, how do we get to a point where a reporter exercising an arguable uh, privilege uh, ends up doing more time than the guy who's the source of the investigation in the first place. Um, one lesson there is that sources, particularly government sources, often have friends who will bail them out. Reporters don't. Um, I mean, reporters have good representation and have ways to defend themselves uh, and have great constitutional protections in some cases. But, but Scooter Libby didn't go to jail because he had a friend who kept him out of jail. Um, Judy Miller couldn't rely on that same kind of support. Um, so one other thing to think about when you're dealing with sources is that you need to be clear for your own protection. Um, now, uh, let's go back to the, the hypothetical earlier and apply it to this. How, does anyone want to offer up an, uh, an idea of what Judy could have said at the outset here that might have kept her out of this kind of trouble? Yeah. Uh -huh. I think there are, in fact, there are a lot of um, First Amendment lawyers now who would counsel uh, reporters to say just that. Uh, let's be clear. I will protect you up to a point, but if I'm about to go to jail, I want you to come forward. Now, there's a risk because the source might then say, well, screw it, because I got somebody from the Washington Post who will he'll go to jail for me, so I'll go tell him instead. <laughs> um, so, you know, you risk losing the story, but you, you would avoid, presumably, this problem. Anything else? Anyone else? Yeah. How about lawyers that might infringe against the law should not be said? Or, um, so you wouldn't have the conversation if the conversation would break the law? Yeah. It's a possibility. You would cut yourself, it would, you would cut yourself off from certain stories there, too. Um, and it, but you would avoid, you certainly would avoid this particular trap. Um, you know, I, I guess the bottom line uh, of this case, as with the hypothetical, is that once you get to the point that the promises have been made, you can, it's very difficult to get back out. Um, and so whatever, whatever you want to set as the parameters, remember, uh, you know, with a source, with an anonymous source, remember that you have to do them early uh, because it gets more and more complicated to extricate yourself as one of these things goes forward. Um, you know, uh, and the other thing, again, to, to remind you from the first, uh, from the hypothetical, um, remember that you're speaking not just for yourself. Um, this case, the Miller case, was incredibly embarrassing and difficult and expensive for the New York Times. Um, you know, and as I say, it ended up in this very sort of half-hearted uh, conclusion where, in the end, after doing her 85 days uh, in jail, Judy Miller comes back out turns over her notes and testifies. So the Times can near, neither take pride in having defended its source all the way to the end, nor can it be at least relieved that it got out early from this thing. It suffered both. 
it, it had to deal with a nationally celebrated test of a principle that it lost. <clears throat> yeah. He did. Libby explicitly uh, gave her permission in the end to do it, and that's when she felt she could uh, she could come forward. Um, now the question there, and, and that's you're, you're absolutely right uh, to mention that because that's an important piece of the narrative here. Um, the question there, though, is um, under what circumstances does he have to do? I mean, in other words, is he being so pressured at the other end uh, for fear that she might release it anyway, or by the issue of waivers, that in effect? Um, her promise is being er eroded to him. Um, but that will happen. And listen, the best thing, I, what I would have argued uh, had I been in the Times newsroom when they were debating this is if rather than having him release her from her promise, if he wants to be identified as the source, have him identify himself as the source. And let's get it over with that way. Because he clearly always has the right, the source always has the right to come clean and say what he or she said. If Libby had done that, and then Miller had been released, that would have solved the problem and cleared the New York Times of sort of any complicity in having to, to turn over a source. I don't, I'm sure that that conversation happened. Why that didn't occur, I don't know. Um, yeah. Um, if Judith Miller had never turned over the source, um, or like Libby had never given her permission, do you think she would have gone back to jail or stayed in jail? Probably. Um, now, it, then it just sort of becomes a, a game of chicken. You know, I mean, who can wait longer? Um, I have to say, uh, Fitzgerald did not strike me as the kind of guy who would give up easily. Uh, so I suspect it could have been a long haul. And I don't want to in any way minimize how painful or difficult that would have been. That's a hard thing. Um, now, th that said, there were other reporters being questioned too. And I haven't gotten into it here because it sort of goes beyond our case study. But uh, Matt Cooper at Time Magazine had a whole different problem, which is that he had notes that he wanted to protect. But Time Magazine asserted that they owned the notes, so they took them from him and turned them over anyway. Um, when we get on Thursday, when we talk about uh, sort of practical things you can do to protect sources, uh, one of the things we'll talk about, one of the things I would suggest is that if you are in these kinds of situations, among the entities not to trust is your employer, which is a really awkward situation because your employer is undoubtedly paying for your lawyer, undoubtedly uh, you know, having to deal with the hassle on it um, and, the, and the publicity and everything else. Um, but it is advisable, I think, to take notes on your own paper, on your own computer, um, you, if you've got no, the notes on your company computer belong to your company, and if you don't want the company turning them over against your objections, don't put them on the company's computer. Um, now, that's, this is awkward stuff, and you don't want to be in that kind of fight with your employer at the same time that you're in a fight with a U.S. attorney. Um, but there are important things. If you take this principle seriously, that you're gonna, you've made a deal, and you're going to stand by that deal, then you have to do the things that make that possible. Yeah, in the back. It's, there's some strange, I mean, obviously, it was not the easiest thing in the world for them to communicate while this was on, gone going. Um, and you're right, there were attempts, uh, you know, he sent this sort of strange, there was this strange kind of coded message, it was unclear what, what they meant to each other. I mean, the problem is that at the moment that it matters, when you're sitting in jail and you want to know whether it's okay with him if you talk, you can't exactly invite him over to have that conversation, you know. Um, so it be, as a practical matter, it became very complicated. Again, it's my view that if Libby wanted to identify himself as the source, nothing prevented him from doing so at any point. He does not need to talk to the New York Times to do that or Time Magazine or anyone else. He can just, you know, the whole world was waiting to hear the answer. If he had called a press conference and said, you know what, I'm the, I'm the guy, that would have been the end of it. And the news organizations would have been relieved of their problems. Yes? Yeah, you know what, I am, uh, the Novak's piece of this is a little murky. Uh, I don't know what Mo Novak said to prosecutors. Um, I don't know whether he talked. Uh, you know, Novak, there's a really interesting timeline of this, if you're interested, on uh, something called factcheck.org that did a nice uh, sort of step-by-step, -step, if you want to look it up. He, um, uh, Novak, of course, is the, is the first one to actually report the name. And again, one of the perversities of this is that Novak doesn't do any time in jail. It's Judy Miller, who never wrote anything, who goes to jail. Uh, I don't know how Novak got himself out from under this. Um, it may be that he talked, but I don't know that for sure. This is, I thought I saw another hand over here somewhere. Oh, uh, yeah. Same, same question, yeah. Um, okay, well, let's move. Where are we? Yeah, we're good. Um, all right, let me talk about another one uh, equally complicated, uh, which is the case of Wen Ho Lee, which you also, I uh, hope, have read about. Um, 
Uh, Wen Ho Lee uh, was a scientist at Los Alamos. Um, and in uh, 1999, after a series of events, which I'll recount quickly here, he was accused of spying for China. Um, uh, the FBI had inv been investigating this uh, case for some time. Um, and on March 6th of 99, the New York Times wrote an exhaustive story about the investigation. Um, the, uh, it was full of dire um, and uh, information, uh, dire information, information that was quite damaging to Lee, although Lee was actually not named in the original piece. The lead of that story uh, reads, uh, working with nuclear secrets stolen from, an American, stolen from an American government laboratory, China has made a leap in the development of nuclear weapons, the miniaturization of its bombs, according to American officials. Okay, so that asserts at the outset on the front page of the New York Times that the material, the nuclear secrets have been stolen from an American's weapons lab, according to American officials. Um, as I say, Lee was not named uh, in that story. But the suspect, who is said to have stuck out like a sore thumb, uh, is the language uh, in the story, was identified as a Los Alamos computer scientist who is Chinese American. Now, I don't know how many Chinese American scientists there are at Los Alamos, but the universe is getting pretty small pretty fast now. Um, there is a source in the piece, uh, as I mentioned the other day, who's quoted as saying that this theft may be worse than the Rosenbergs, uh, the famous or infamous case from the 19, uh, uh, 50, 40s and 50s, um, which also involved Los Alamos. Uh, the suspect also was said uh, to have failed the lie detector test. Um, so, and then by the way, there's this underlying accusation in the piece. It's a hugely long piece. I have a copy of it here. In fact, it's what I spilled the water over on uh, earlier. Um, uh, it's, it's pages and pages long. Um, the underlying accusation is that the government um, knew about or suspected uh, that there was uh, espionage going on at Los Alamos and that it's dragged its feet because that that in some way crossed off American diplomatic uh, overtures toward China. Um, so you got a story that says that there's ongoing espionage at the you know, most famous American nuclear uh, facility, that it's potentially hugely damaging to American security, um, and that it's being brushed under the rug uh, for diplomatic concerns. That is, by any standard, a blockbuster uh, piece of journalism. Um, the government, needless to say, uh, was not thrilled uh, to be accused of uh, dragging its feet on a case of this importance. Uh, and two days later, two days after the story appeared, Lee was fired. Um, he was later uh, indicted. Uh, I think it was 59, yeah, 59 counts of mishandling classified data. Um, he was publicly identified in much news coverage as a spy. Um, he was held in solitary confinement um, and, needless to say, subjected to you know, international pillory. I mean, his friends, neighbors, everyone now believed or believed that, at least believed that the government believed uh, that he was a spy. In those 59 counts, though, that he was indicted on, espionage was not among them. He was accused of mishandling this data. And in, in fairness to both sides here, Lee created some real troubles for himself uh, in this case. He had created this uh, private archive of sensitive uh, classified material. He had over 1,600, or I think it was about 1,600 uh, electronic files on a, a private system, but one that was accessible via the internet. Um, he, he later said, he wrote a memoir, uh, later said that he was trying to protect the information against crashes, that he'd had difficulties when Los Alamos uh, computer systems had had glitches and problems. And so he was putting this into a system so he could work more efficiently. Um, uh, but it was at best foolish uh, of him to be handling data in such a, in such a careless way. Um, still, set all that aside, whether he was, uh, whether he was foolish or, or careless or stupid or whatever to handle the data as he did, the government never even charged him with espionage. Um, and by this point, everyone who paid attention to this case assumed that there was a spy at Los Alamos. Um, so, Case goes on. Uh, Lee is, as I say, indicted on these 59 counts. He contests them. He's held uh, in solitary confinement while these proceedings go back and forth. Ultimately, the government allows him to plead to one count of mishandling data, and he is uh, his entire sentence is the time he's already served in solitary. So one on, on, you know one morning, Wen Ho Lee is a threat to American national security, and the next day he's free. Um, uh, he's free today. He went, in fact, I, I read in one of the reviews that he went fishing uh, the next day. So one day he's, you know, he's in prison, and the next day he's fishing. Um, I guess it's obvious that uh, Lee has every right to be pretty upset with the United States government. Um, 
But what about the press uh, in this? Um, in the first instance, it is um, arguable that the piece that the New York Times published is what got him arrested, that by embarrassing the government, by, by pointing out how long this investigation had been going on and to, to so little end, that it's arguable that the, the press sort of goaded the government uh, into the arrest in the first place. Um, in the subsequent coverage about the case as it unfolded, there were many uh, disclosures to the press about information in Wen Ho Lee's uh, personnel file. Um, government officials have an obligation to people who work for the government not to release information, certain private information that's in their files. Um, so Lee, once the case was over, sued the government for the improper release of his files. But now he's got a problem that's not exactly like the one Fitzgerald had with the Fifth Amendment and First Amendment rights sort of in conflict. His problem is he wants to know who in the government to sue. Because the whole government didn't release his personnel file. There's some official somewhere, or officials, could be more than one person. I don't, I'm happy to say that. I don't know. Um, uh, he doesn't sue the news organizations for libeling him because it's true. That, I mean, this report, while... Um, in certain ways, I think, hyperbolic. I think it overstated, in some ways, the case against him. Um, and there's some language that the New York Times uh, certainly regrets about this piece. But the underlying notion that there was an investigate, an ongoing, long-standing investigation of espionage of Los Alamos is true. The question is whether the investigation was finding anything real or whether it was just misguided. Um, so he doesn't, he doesn't sue the New York Times for libeling him. Um, he sues the government for disclosing things about him. And, and not by, although the New York Times wrote the initial story, many other organizations followed up, including the Los Angeles Times, followed up with their own reporting about this case. Um, so the disclosures occurred not just, the disclosures that he then objects to from his personnel file don't occur just to the New York Times, but they uh, go to the Los Angeles Times, the Wall Street Journal, and I think two or three other news organizations. Um, so he sues the government and then says in the course of those proceedings, I want the journalists to be compelled to tell me who told them this information from my file. Um, so now you've got the news organizations are not themselves being sued, but a judge is now considering whether for his suit to be effectively carried forward, whether the news organizations have to give up the source so that he can then proceed with his case against the government. Same basic situation now arises. The reporters say, no, we talked to this person or people. Again, I don't know who. Um, off the record, our deal is that we will not disclose the source. Presumably, disclosing the source would be a violation of that understanding, contract. And presumably, that source would be hurt uh, by the disclosure of that. Um, so they say, no, we're not telling you. Um, the judge takes up the matter, rules against the news organizations says I'll start imposing fines, and it's not out of the question that I'll start putting people in jail. Um, you know, the question then at this point is how is Lee, assuming that you know, there's no ethical problem with him proceeding with a case against the government if in fact there's been a violation of his rights, how is he supposed to proceed with that if the journalists stand by their ethical obligation? Um, and let me just pause on this for a moment uh, because it raises a really interesting question if he's innocent. Um, the news organizations have now been complicit in making him seem guilty, not because they reported something incorrect, but because they relied on a source who may have been wrong. And what are the implications? To make the, this even worse, and, and again, I, I don't know the underlying facts, but what if the source did it to him on purpose? What if the source intentionally made him look guilty for whatever reason lied to the news organizations, and defamed Wen Ho Lee. What then is the ethical responsibility of a journalist in the middle of that situation? And again, I want to stress, I don't have any reason to believe that the source did the, do this in this case deliberately. But just in terms of testing these principles, um, what do you do? Any ideas? Would anyone argue that if you, if again, hypothetically, if you came to the conclusion that the source had deliberately defamed Lee, that you would be entitled to re reveal the name of the source? Uh, yeah, go ahead. I think you'd have to make an agreement, like as was suggested by the other thing, that I'll protect you as long as you promise to tell the truth. 
That certainly, um, well, in this case, though, I, it's, an interest, it's an interesting point in this case. If you had made, a, if the deal, if your deal with the source at the outset had been, I will tell you just that. I will, I will protect your identity as long as I'm confident you're telling the truth. I don't know that you would have ever gotten to a disclosure point in this case, because as I say, I have no information that suggests that the source, I mean, if all the source then did is give you information about his personnel background, and that information is true, and presumably it is true, that information, the source may not have done anything to violate that agreement. You're right that the, the uh, to answer the hypothetical that I then posed out of it, if you came to the conclusion, however, however you came to it, if you came to the conclusion that the source was now using that anonymity to lie, then if you'd made that deal at the outset, presumably it would give you an out. Um, don't know if that occurred here. I, don't, I have no reason to think it did. Yes, go ahead. Is it possible to actually uh, ask the source that um, he or she should actually provide some evidence or proof that he is telling the truth? Mm -hmm. It is, and it's desirable too. I think that's a good, uh, a good way to help protect against some of this. One thing that, um, you know, there are different kinds of anonymous sources, and maybe I should have said this at the outset, though it's sort of implicit. Um, some sources provide oral details. Uh, others provide material. Um, I had a case in my own reporting life uh, when I covered the police department. Willie Williams was then the chief, and he had taken some trips to Las Vegas, and the question was whether the, he had gotten freebies uh, from Las Vegas casinos, which is something the police department discourages police chiefs from doing. Um, and then he was questioned about it by the police commission, and the allegation was that he lied uh, in response. Um, there was a long investigation. This was a very celebrated case at the time. Um, ultimately, I had a source or sources, I, I, you know, to this day I can't tell you and, and wouldn't even if I could, um, uh, who provided me with the investigative packet uh, that included the initial allegations, it included his written response, it included some other material, I'm forgetting all of it, it's a long time ago now, but, um, and there was a leak investigation and I declined to cooperate and ultimately the fun part of this is that then the, the leak investigation was transmitted to the city council and it leaked the same day. Um, so, uh, you know, it's hard to keep this stuff secret. Um, but uh, my point there being, I didn't rely on sources who were describing something. I relied on sources who provided written material. Then there's a, then there's a second obligation once you get it, which is to confirm that it's real. Because, you know, there's this issue with Dan Rather a couple summers ago where he had what appear to have been forged records regarding uh, President Bush's National Guard service. So just having documents doesn't make something true. This is especially true, by the way, if people provide emails, extremely easy to fabricate uh, emails. So the, the obligation on a reporter who gets written material is to confirm that it is what it purports to be. But a nice thing about written material as opposed to just or an oral representation is that you have something to go on. The source, you're no longer as dependent on the source's biases or, or you know, I mean, a source might describe a meeting for you and might not have heard things. Well, maybe he's out of the room for part of it. So you're, you're always limited if, if you don't have underlying material. And that's one thing that you can definitely do and should do when you have source material is to try to validate it, uh, verify it rather, with, uh, with written material. Yes? Excellent question. Uh, depends on the case. Um, uh, for instance, I'll, I'll talk, I'm not talking about my police experience uh, to say that it's so important, but I know the facts of it, so it's easier for me to remember. Um, I, I know what investigative uh, paperwork from the LAPD looks like, so I can tell you right at the outset whether it's the correct forms. Whether you know there was something called a I'm going to forget them, but there was, there was identifying labels for different kind of internal affairs reports, for police commission documents. So I could tell you right away whether they appeared to be true. Now, that doesn't get me past the possibility that someone has cleverly fabricated them. One thing that agencies will often do to try to make it difficult um, for reporters to rely on documents um, is to number them um, so that if you have a document, you show it to someone, then whoever you show it to will be able to figure out whose document it was. Um, Another, but the really sneaky agencies, uh, will change the doc each copy of the document. So one word or a couple words will be different. And they'll know who got which copy. Um, this is one thing that we talk about a lot at the paper when it comes to posting stuff on the web. Um, it's very tempting if you're doing an investigative report to put all your investigative material on the web because it proves oh, we didn't make this up. You know, this is what it relies on. But if someone has engaged in that kind of practice um, of changing words or numbering or something, sometimes putting the material up will expose the source. Uh, I guess what I would counsel in those instances is that it has to be part of your conversation with the source. Um, if the source says, listen, I, I'm, 
I'm sure they didn't number these documents. No one took it that seriously. Go ahead and put it up. And then the source gets outed. Well, at least he's, he or she has done so knowingly. You haven't done it. You've done it by agreement with them. Um, those are, I would say, the exception, not the rule. It's pretty rare that there's that level of classification on material or that degree of seriousness about sort of hiding the source. Uh, but I don't think you can start posting things that a source gives you without permission to do so. And similarly, you can't start showing it to other sources to verify it without the same kind of understanding. Now, one, one thing that I have done um, uh, in this, over the years is to call someone. So for instance, let's say there's a police commission document. Um, I can't remember if I did this in the particular case that I described, but a police commission document, rather than take it to uh, someone at the police commission and say, is this a real document? I would read it to them and say, I've got this document. It says X. Um, is that consistent with the file? Off the record, can you tell me if that's what's in the file? And someone might say yes. Uh, now I've passed along the substance of the material. I've, valid, I've, you know, I've verified the, the underlying material without doing it in a way that would put the actual document in their hands. Sometimes that's enough. Sometimes it isn't. I, that's why you have to play these by ear a little bit. Yes? If an anonymous source gives you materials that could be stolen or were confidential and weren't supposed to be given to you, would the reporter be held legally responsible for that act if they're anonymous? Or? When our, uh, <coughs> when the lawyers come in to talk to you later in the course, I hope you'll ask them that question. Um, <laughs> it is my position, I mean, generally what lawyers will tell you is it's better to obey the law. Um, and receiving something that's stolen <coughs> could get you in Dutch uh, with the law. Um, <coughs> I don't have a problem with it. <clears throat> um, uh, now, um, it would depend. Now, listen, I wouldn't, what I wouldn't do is I wouldn't put someone up to breaking the law. I wouldn't say, listen, I happen to know that, you know, in the chief's office, there's a file that would be a great story. You know, I know that he's leaving at five. Could you sneak in there and get it? Then I think you're actually suborning and you're encouraging someone to do something illegal. There is a, a case, uh, I don't know if all of you have seen, what's the movie about the uh, cigarette case, uh, 60 Minutes? Um, it's a popular movie four or five years ago. Um, there's a tobacco case, in any case. What, what it was is 60 Minutes at a whistleblower, and what is it? No, not that one. Um, it's with Russell Crowe, that's right, in any case. It'll, it'll come to me, or maybe it'll come to you, one of you. But, um, uh, in the, that, that fictionalizes, but generally describes a real incident where uh, 60 Minutes um, was reporting on uh, tobacco companies and whether they were hiding um, health, negative health effects of cigarettes. Um, and there was a, an employee of the tobacco companies who had signed a non-disclosure agreement um, promising that he would not disclose certain facts uh, about the company and about cigarettes. 60 Minutes flew him to New York and I think they put him up in a nice hotel and they, did they didn't pay him, but they, they did certain things that were sort of attractive. And the question was, did that induce him to violate his contractual agreement with, um, with uh, Phil, I think it was Phil Morris, one of the cigarette companies. And, and that, so that issue was very much in play, is sort of how much can they go to get him to break an agreement or break the law. Um, my own view, anyway, and this, uh, our, our lawyers, including my wife, uh, may disagree with this, but um, is that if the, if the act has been committed and you are now just receiving the documents, the fruits of that act, that as long as you weren't there at the front end encouraging it, I'm okay with it. Um, as I say, people could disagree about that. Um, but it, that's the line that I would draw, ethically. Yes? Um, this doesn't apply to any certain case. What if there was a judge, like a confident judge, just a person that a reporter could take the documents to and get their blessing, quote unquote, and then in their article say that I showed it to the mm -hmm. judge, just have some title, some position, and then that would bolster the credibility I've never heard of anyone doing that. Uh, it's an interesting idea. Uh, I mean, I will tell you that in general, um, we are sort of reluctant to put, uh, we, when I say we, I mean the newspaper, are reluctant to cede over to other people the, the judgment about what we're going to run and in what context. Um, uh, in this, you know, with that idea to uh, sort of document verification, uh, 
you know, I suppose you could do that with a judge. I suppose you could do it with, I mean, we've, I know of instances where we have sent stuff to handwriting experts to try to determine whether uh, the, a document really was written by the person we're saying it's written by. Um, so there are certainly instances where we've gone outside for verification um, and where you have to. As I said earlier, it's, you're not, you have an obligation to. I don't think we've ever, I mean, I think bringing a judge into it might introduce other sort of legal complexities, but it's certainly an interesting idea. I mean, I don't, I don't know whether we would do it. If so, it would be under very special circumstances. Anyone else on this issue? Yeah, Tom. The Insider, that's right, thank you. It's a good movie, by the way. Um, okay, um, so in Lee, uh, as in uh, the Miller case, um, the issue is you've got a, you've got a in this case, journalists, it's many, actually in, in Miller too, you've got a number of journalists in both cases who have promised anonymity and who are stuck with the promise that they made. So that's the point I'd like to sort of hammer home today is that that's, it's that initial promise that is complicated. What's interesting about Lee, um, that somewhat differentiates uh, his case uh, from the uh, Scooter Libby case is that there's no criminal charge looming in Lee. Um, this is a purely, this is all about money, um, money and reputation. Um, so there's not the issue of that we described earlier where there, the crime, you know, that there's this, this sort of Fifth Amendment, uh, First Amendment uh, complication to it. Um, plus the stakes are somewhat lower. Uh, we're talking about money as opposed to um, someone going to prison. Um, uh, the, let me just uh, tell you what the end of the Lee story is, um, is that the case against the government, uh, the case against the government was stuck uh, by the refusal of the journalists to disclose the names. Um, so what ensued was an extremely complicated uh, negotiation between the news organizations, the government, and Lee to settle the case. Um, and what ended up happening, um, I forget the exact dollar amount, but the government paid half the settlement and the news organizations split the other half. Um, so Lee got his money. He got, you know, the vindication that goes with being paid, and the news organizations were able to protect their sources. Um, now, that was a controversial resolution in some quarters because I think some folks felt that the news organizations should sort of just hold out forever and refuse to pay them. Um, the fact is it was also costly. It was going to go on a long time. These are expensive uh, proceedings. Um, and so it was a, uh, it was a practical solution um, that preserved the ultimate principle, which is that the journalist didn't have to turn over the name. Um, is it uh, appetizing uh, that it also meant that the news organizations had to chip into the kitty? Well, well, maybe not. Um, but in, in some instances, you have to make tough choices. Uh, and I guess in my view, uh, in this instance, uh, we ended up with sort of the best that we could have, which is to say that we protected what really mattered uh, to the news organizations, which is that we not be in the business of ratting out sources. Uh, so um, just to conclude, um, let me just say that all uh, all of these cases uh, turn, uh, and I'm to some degree repeating myself now, but on this, on the idea that you can make in, the, in a casual, careless moment, you can tell someone, you tell me what you got and I will not tell a soul, uh, and then you are really stuck uh, if you do it. So it's that moment that has to be really handled carefully. Um, and it's worth thinking about, uh, if you ever find yourself uh, in a comparable moment, what you could say that would protect you against some of the problems that we've talked about here today that arose. Yeah, these are very celebrated cases, but, but they also, this kind of thing happens quite routinely. And, you know, you can end up in a, in a I mean, I, I can't count for you the number of conversations, you know, that I have had in bars with police officers where someone has said, you know, I heard something great today, just don't use my name, and I've said okay. And I'm lucky that that has not uh, stung me, but it's the easiest thing in the world um, to say, I'll protect you in the moment and then not realizing that you've put yourself, uh, a news organization, your colleagues all on the hook for something that could, could play out in very hard to predict ways. Um, uh, so uh, on Thursday, I'd like to talk about ways that we can uh, sort of anticipate those conversations, avoid them, and also a little bit more about the kind of general ethics uh, in this area. Um, let me uh, remind you uh, chapter seven and nine uh, from the textbook. Uh, anyone who hasn't done the readings on Miller uh, and Lee, please do. I'm going to have some stuff to hand out to you uh, on Thursday for next week. Next week, or yeah, next week we're going to talk about precision and writing um, and how it can create uh, create or get you out of ethics issues. And so I want to have some material for you after that. So, anyway, thank you all. Enjoy your week. <clears throat>